This is John Walton in his teaching on the book of Job. This is session number 22, God speech number 2, Bahimot and Leviathan, and Job's response. Job chapter 40, verse 6 through chapter 41, verse 34. <music> Now we finally get to Yahweh's second speech. We're going to move beyond the ignorance of humans to actually get to the idea of how people are supposed to think. It's intriguing that this core message of the book is in the part of the book that has been considered most inaccessible, most confusing, and Basically, people just throw up their hands and say they don't know what to do with it. Yet, it contains precisely how the book wants us to think. We're going to have some fun with it. Let's take a look. It starts off uh, as God introduces his second speech in verse 6 of chapter 40. And again, Yahweh speaks out of the storm. Remember here, if I haven't mentioned it, Yahweh is speaking. It's not Elohim, it's not Shaddai, it's not Adonai, it's Yahweh speaking. We had Yahweh in the prologue, and now we have Yahweh's speeches at the end. Again, that gives us an Israelite feel. Job has spoken of El Shaddai, but it's Yahweh who comes to clarify. And so it's interesting that, uh, that Yahweh is speaking. So we read his first few lines in uh, in this address to Job, brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you will answer me. Of course, Job's been the one asking the questions. Job's been the one making the demands. Job's been trying to um, deal with Yahweh's silence, and now Yahweh is not coming to answer. He's coming to question. Uh, so Job had all his questions. And now there's none left on the table, so to speak. Job has put his hand over his mouth, so he's done asking his questions. And now Yahweh is going to question him. Verse 8 is very important. He says, would you discredit my justice? Would you, would you condemn me to justify yourself? We can see then, if it hasn't been clear in Job's speeches, we can see that Job has called into question God's justice. Yahweh himself says so. So again, we're reminded that Job has not done justice to God's reputation. God, Job has not uh, responded well to everything that has taken place. Job has not expressed a good sense of God. So, here that's made very clear. And now what God does is he challenges Job. Do you have an arm like God's? Can your voice thunder like his? Adorn yourself with glory and splendor and clothe yourself in honor and majesty. Unleash the fury of your wrath. It's as if Yahweh is saying, okay, Job, try being God for a day. You really think you've got this all figured out, how it works? Well, let's see how well that all works. Verse 12. Look at all those who are proud and humble them. Crush the wicked while they stand. You think that's how the system works? Justice is a foundation? It says, it'd be worth seeing if you could actually pull it off. But now he turns his attention to the two creatures, Behemoth and Leviathan. He's reprimanded Job for considering his own righteousness, Job's righteousness, as a basis for questioning God's justice. He rhetorically challenges Job's ability to impose justice on the world. Right? Job thinks that's what God does, the retribution principle, and God challenges Job to impose justice on the world. And so he introduces these characters, Behemoth and Leviathan, to address the desired posture that people should have. Let's start by talking about their identity. They are not known natural species, nor now extinct ones. 
I'm not going to go into much detail on that, but it really is pretty clear when we examine the uh, features of these creatures. They simply don't match up with anything that we know. Um, the element in Leviathan that's most difficult to match up with any biological or extinct species is breathing fire. We really don't know of anyone that does that, any creature that does that. And so, in that sense, um, we have to look elsewhere. I would propose that they are chaos creatures. Chaos creatures is a well-known category in the ancient Near East and very, very easily recognizable by the ancient audience. They know exactly about chaos creatures. And Leviathan is a known chaos creature, not only in the other places in the Hebrew Bible, but also in the Ugaritic texts. Chaos creatures are liminal creatures that exist on the periphery of the ordered world, almost like one foot in, one foot out. They are quintessential creatures whose abstract characteristics are shared by known animals. The idea that some people have seen some uh, semblance of hippopotamus in Behemoth or some semblance of uh, crocodile in Leviathan uh, only goes so far as to suggest that a hippopotamus or a crocodile would be sort of the, the spawn of Behemoth or Leviathan, uh, their, their cohorts. Not that Behemoth actually is a hippopotamus or that Leviathan actually is a crocodile. The category of chaos creatures is populated by, as I said, liminal creatures, kind of on the edges, that have been seen, such as coyote or owl or ostrich or hyena, as well as fearsome beasts only seen in the eyes of the imagination. Both types are in this category of chaos creatures. The latter group, these fearsome beasts, is not strictly zoological. In fact, they are often composite creatures. So the head of a lion, the wings of an eagle, griffin-like or sphinx-like creatures. And so chaos creatures are often composite, but not always. The chaos creatures are considered to have been created by God. We see this especially in Genesis 1, the great ocean creatures um, in, the, uh, in 121. But they represent the potential for continuing non-order like the thorns and thistles in the less ordered realm outside the garden. The thorns and thistles are evidence of non-order, yet they are in a partially ordered world. When God talks about Leviathan in Psalm 104, he made Leviathan to sport with. And when the great seagoing creatures are referred to in Genesis 1.21, it's, they're part of God's creation. In fact, Genesis comes back and uses the word bara, create, for the first time in Genesis 1 since verse 1, to specifically attach it to the sea monsters, just to make it clear that they are also part of the ordered system. So in one sense, we could call them anti-cosmos creatures. They kind of work against cosmos, um, but they're not strictly uh, in the realm of non-order. They're part of the ordered world, but they serve as agents of non-order by virtue of their mindless nature. Chaos creatures are not morally evil, but they can do serious harm because they just operate by instinct. So in one sense, we could compare to how we might think of a tornado it's not morally evil, but it can do serious harm because it does what tornadoes do. Chaos creatures, then, are not enemies of God, but they can wreak havoc among humans. 
Just as the sea is in the realm of non-order, yet it is controlled by God with its boundaries set. These creatures are not domesticated in any sense, yet they're under God's control. Behemoth is actually the plural of the word cattle, uh, and it refers to the most potent land animal imaginable. It's sort of an abstraction of land animals. Leviathan would be the most potent sea creature imaginable. And so the text uses these two sort of um, characterizing chaos creatures. And again, hippopotami and crocodiles are certainly dangerous, and they may loosely be considered as the spawn or minions of chaos creatures such as these. Now, having said this, we should recognize that the identity of the creatures is not as important as recognizing their literary role as characters in the book. The ancient audience would have recognized Behemoth and Leviathan. They would have had identities connected to them. But regardless of that, Behemoth and Leviathan are being used by the author of the book as characters, literary characters, that have a role and a purpose in the book. If we're going to understand the authoritative message of the book using these literary characters, we have to look beyond the controversies of identity to see how they are used. Chaos creatures have been referred to in the book on numerous occasions. So, reading through the book, we've already seen those. Job's lament in chapter 3 spoke of those who were ready to take on Leviathan in 3.8. Job's first response to Eliphaz, he asked why God was treating him as a chaos creature. That's in 7.12. There he uses the Hebrew word tanin, which is the same Hebrew word in Genesis 1.21. And Job feels like he's being treated as a chaos creature because God is keeping him under guard. Now, that fits with what we know in the ancient Near East. The gods in the ancient Near East were known to keep partially domesticated chaos creatures on leash and to use them for their purposes, even though they represented this realm of non-order. So Job suggests that God himself is then acting like a chaos creature in chapter 30, verses 15 through 23. God is not treating Job as a chaos creature as much as he's asking Job to step into the role of behemoth. God is not acting like a chaos creature. Instead, he is far superior to Leviathan and should be recognized as such. Now, that's introducing how I believe Behemoth and Leviathan are being used in the text. Again, Job has accused God of acting like a chaos creature, and God says, oh no, it's worse than that. It's, it's, it's bigger than that. And so we're going to get that explained to us as we observe uh, what is being said. We need to analyze Behemoth and Leviathan, not for their identity, but for their literary role. So, when we open up uh, to chapter 40, verse 15, God directs Job's attention to Behemoth. Look at Behemoth, and then pay attention to the next line. Look at Behemoth, which I made along with you. Job and Behemoth are grouped together. God has created both. It's interesting that when we look through that brief section dealing with Behemoth, it goes through verse 24. Uh, so 15 through 24, Yahweh does not speak of either Job or himself as doing anything to Behemoth. In verse 15, Behemoth is content and well-fed, as Job has been. Remember, 15 introduced the comparison. 
So, content and well-fed, as Job has been. In 16 through 18, God made Behemoth strong, as he made Job. In 40 verse 19, Behemoth ranks among ranks first among its kind, as Job does. That was identified in 15.7. In verse 20, Behemoth is cared for, as Job was. In 21 to 22 of chapter 40, Behemoth is sheltered, as Job was. In 23, now it's starting to make a transition, 23 and 24, the end of the Behemoth section. In 23, Behemoth is not alarmed by the raging river. Inference, or implication rather, and neither should you be. He trusts and is secure, as you should be. He cannot be captured or trapped, to which you should also be invulnerable and have shown yourself resistant. Verse 24, it talks about the, that can anyone captured by the eyes or trap it and pierce its nose? The word for nose is the word for anger. And it cannot be pierced. This is a difficult word in the text. It sometimes means named or designated or sometimes penetrated. And so again, here the idea is to which you should also be invulnerable. Behemoth is being compared to Job. That's introduced right in the first verse. After that, everything that we read about Behemoth, we should compare it to Job. That's how this section is working. Job, then, should be like Behemoth. Remember, Job had claimed, you're treating me like a chaos creature. And here the speech says, well, you should be a little more like a chaos creature in this regard. We'll come back to that. Let's turn to a Leviathan, a longer section. And again, let's pay careful attention to what it says and what it doesn't say. <clears throat> the first eight verses use the second person forms. Can you do this? Can you do that? Second person forms, focusing on what Job can and cannot do to Leviathan. With a little bit, I think more than a little bit, of the idea, if you can't do these things to Leviathan, pull it in with a fish hook, tie down its tongue, put a cord through its nose. Okay, will it beg for mercy? Will it be gentle with you? Can you make an agreement with you? Can you make a pet of it? If you wouldn't do that with Leviathan, why would you expect to do it to Yahweh? Why would you expect to trap him, pin his tongue down, make an agreement with him, domesticate him? Why would you do it? The switch to second person suggests that Leviathan is to be compared to Yahweh. So 41.3, will it keep begging you for mercy? That's what Job's kind of wanted God to do. Verses 10 and 11, no one is fierce enough to rouse it. Who then is able to stand against me? Who has a claim against me that I must pay? Yahweh himself draws the connection between himself and Leviathan. Not so much that he is like Leviathan, but that he is so much greater than Leviathan. And if you can't act toward Leviathan in this way, why in the world would you think that you can act toward Yahweh in this way? This section never talks about what God does to Leviathan. Yet so many interpreters have gone that direction. Okay, This does not talk about Yahweh's control of Leviathan. It does not talk about Yahweh defeating Leviathan. We've got a different sort of statement being made here. 
in 41, as we move through this information, Leviathan cannot be controlled, neither can Yahweh. Leviathan will not submit or beg for mercy, neither will Yahweh. Leviathan can't be wounded or subdued. It's hopeless to struggle against him. Same is true for Yahweh. We read the outright comparison in 10. In 11, no one, including you, has a claim against me, Job. In 12 through 18, you can't force open his mouth to receive the bridle. Do we get that? What has Job been trying to do? He's been trying to harness and bridle Yahweh. Yahweh cannot be controlled or domesticated. He is not tame. 19 through 25, Leviathan is dangerous when riled, as is Yahweh. 26 through 32, Leviathan is invulnerable, as is Yahweh. Verse 33, no creature is his equal. That implies, of course, that Job is not Leviathan's equal, let alone being Yahweh's equal. Verse 34, Leviathan dominates all who are proud. Compare that to the opening of this speech in 11 through 14, where God says to Job, you know, arm yourself, dominate those who are evil. It's Leviathan who dominates all who are proud. Job cannot humble the proud, back to chapter 40, verses 11 and 12, nor can he subdue the king over the proud, 41, 34. God is also king of the proud, and in that sense, he rules over them. All of this discusses what Job can't do to Leviathan, and they are also things that Job must learn he cannot do to Yahweh. It's what Job must learn, and it's what we all must learn. We cannot domesticate God. So, the role of these creatures in the message of the book. First of all, they are not portrayed as the embodiment of cosmic evil. One interpreter has even suggested that they are equivalent to the challenger at the beginning of the book. And I see it as almost totally opposite of that. Neither creature is described as evil. Neither creature represents Hasatan, the challenger, nor do they take up the role or the position of the challenger from the early chapters. They are not described in such a way that they can serve as evidence of God's ability to subdue threats to order in the world and to bring cosmic justice. The text just doesn't treat them that way. It doesn't present them that way. There's no reference to God subduing them. So how can they stand as testimony to God subduing non-order? We have to go with what the text says. Cosmic justice is neither hanging in the balance nor the result of what Yahweh is said to do. The book does not assert that God brings justice, either to the cosmos as a whole or to human experience. The book does not make that claim. That's the claims that Job and his friends wanted to make through the retribution principle. The first speech of Yahweh indicated how Job should not think. The second speech indicates how Job should think. In neither speech does Yahweh address Job's righteousness or his own justice. This contains the closest that we have to an explicit message, which is what we would expect in Yahweh's climatic climactic speech. The point made concerning Behemoth involves its stability in the surging waters. Behemoth is not righteous. 
Leviathan is not just. Bamoth cannot be moved. Leviathan cannot be challenged. Yahweh does not defeat them or harness them to show his superiority over them. They are used as illustrations from which humans can learn some important lessons. Humans should respond to raging rivers with security and trust, as Behemoth does in this literary presentation. Humans should not think that they, that they can domesticate or challenge Yahweh, since they can't challenge or domesticate Leviathan, who is inferior to Yahweh. Job's second response in chapter 42, verses 2 through 6, shows that he understands the points Yahweh is making. I'll read it quickly. I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Again, that means Job can't tame him or domesticate him to Job's own purposes. You asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Notice obscuring God's plans here. Job obscured God's plans because he indicated that God's plans were to carry out the retribution principle. To order the cosmos according to justice. That addresses God's plans. Who obscures God's plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me. Wonderful is basically, um, it's beyond the human pay grade. No, you can't understand it. You said, listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you will answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Again, to me, this shows that he acknowledges that he had been presumptuous in what he thought he knew. He recants and he submits. This isn't like his first response where he just said, I'm done talking. He recants and he submits. The Hebrew word here for too wonderful for me, things I did not know, the Hebrew word pele refers to information in the divine realm that is beyond human understanding. On the word repent, let's say a little bit about that. It's in verse 6. Repent in dust and ashes. It's the nifal form of the verb nacham. It's distinguished from other words that can be translated repent. Eliphaz had urged him to repent. That was the word shuv, to turn back, to change direction, uh, change his behavior. Here Job does not suggest behavior change, but rather wishes to retract his previous statements. He employs the same verb and form that's used when God changes his mind. Places like Exodus 32.14, Jeremiah 4.28, Jeremiah 18.10, Joel 2.13, Jonah 3.10. All intriguing passages that unfortunately we can't spend the time addressing. Many of its occurrences take place in situations involving regret. It's an expression of regret. In Job's statements, uh, he regrets his previous statements. His characterization of God, his presumptuous belief in his own understanding, his arrogant challenges. That's how we would understand Job's regret. The statement here opens up other issues as well. When used with the preposition all, as here, it typically means to reconsider something, or more often, to put something out of mind, to forget all about it. In this verse, we might suggest that that something that he puts out of his mind is his dust and ashes. 
That's what it says. It says he has, well, it says repent concerning all. So he puts out of his mind his dust and ashes. It's not repenting with dust and ashes. That's not the preposition here. Rather, he reconsiders the whole dust and ashes thing. He puts dust and ashes out of his mind. He has therefore announced the end to his mourning. And he has accepted his reality. We can see then that Behemoth and Leviathan are extremely important characters in the shaping of the book. This is not about hippopotami and crocodiles. It's not about dinosaurs. It's not about whether we're talking mythology or things of that sort. It's really not even about chaos creatures, though they are. And it's about how these creatures are portrayed and how that stands as a message to Job and to all of us reading the book. And we'll address those issues as we move to other segments. This is John Walton in his teaching on the book of Job. This is session number 22, God speech number 2, Bahimot and Leviathan, and Job's response. Job chapter 40, verse 6 through chapter 41, verse 34. 